Thank you. Good afternoon. Go after me there. <laughs> <laughs> and all the other languages. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you so much, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction. It's the kind of introduction that um, makes you think, I should just go home now <laughs> and not, not disappoint people after what they heard, so um, thank you so much. And um, I, I have to say this is probably the most incredible event that I've ever had the pleasure of attending in my whole academic career, and I mean the incredible in the literal sense, hard to believe. Why would anybody put together such an event? I haven't won a prize, I haven't acquired a new chair, I haven't even yet published this book. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very grateful and um, incredibly honored. And to think that I almost didn't make it, because I, I have to tell you in the spirit of full disclosure, I just got over COVID. I was exposed 10 days ago, uh, tested positive last Tuesday, so eight days ago. I feel well, I don't think I'm contagious, which is why I'm here, but if I seem a little bit <laughs> Standoffish when I see you is not because I'm not happy to see you. <laughs> it's because I'm a little bit worried that there might just be something residual in case you are particularly uh, uh, immune compromised or anything. Um, if I feel the need to put on a mask later on during the conference, it's not because I'm paranoid or virtue signaling. I would be doing it for you. So, uh, enough about that. I am so happy to be here, despite everything that Sarah mentioned. Um, I have to thank um, my students and other young people here. Uh, triply, first, because uh, some of you have put together this conference, um, others uh, presenting here others attending, but not just that. Uh, the book itself was written, uh, as you all know, if you were involved. Uh, during the pandemic, the first draft of this book was written in Zoom meetings with my PhD students. Week by week, I, I would just produce some kind of chapter, and they'd get together and discuss it. And that is one of my favorite memories of the pandemic. And finally, just the whole life you together bring to Cambridge, to our department, and to myself. Um, I have to say all these things because I was so generous about um, explaining the circumstances of, of this meeting. I'm very pleased and in fact a little bit proud that the main organizers of this meeting are actually not those people who should count me as their so-called doctor father, right? Not quite that. Uh, with, with Yuri Wittven and, and Bob Foss, uh, I am what is known in Cambridge as their, I have been uh, Yuri a long time ago, uh, their advisor, which is sort of like your doctor uncle. Um, <laughs> the secondary person who looks after you in various ways, and you heard Sarah's story about how she came to know me. Uh, there was no formal connection at all, but just um, an informal kind of sustained um, engagement. And then in the case of Helena Scott Forsman, uh, it was an inspired idea by Karen Tuber to send Helene to Cambridge to work with me and judging from the subject of our you know, research and so on, a casual observer would have thought this is crazy. <laughs> There's no fit here at all, but Karen knew something that we couldn't see and it's worked out wonderfully. So, uh, thank you everyone and thanks also to 
all the people who are going to be presenting and commenting, thank you all for being here. It is nice to be back in Denmark. It's nice to be back in Copenhagen. Um, this is the last thing I'll say before I actually give you the substance of today's presentation. Every time I come to Denmark, it's a journey of realizing how horribly I had been mispronouncing Danish words. <laughs> so on my last trip, it was Hannah Anderson's name. Uh, this time is the, the name itself of your wonderful city. Um, I'm one of those English speakers who, who have very conscientiously been saying Copenhagen uh, <laughs> rather than Copenhagen, uh, not realizing this is the, the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, in fact, the English should have anglicized Copenhagen as Copenhagen, because there are lots of places in England called something haven. Right, and in the U.S., the famous New Haven, where Yale is, and Brookhaven, where great physics has happened. But we're stuck with Copenhagen, so um, wonderful to be here. In any case, now uh, I'm going to give you the uh, substance of this presentation in six parts, starting with some motivations. In this book that we're all here to discuss. I'm proposing new pragmatist conceptions of knowledge, truth, and reality, also inquiring. But you might ask, why would anybody want to do such a thing? Now, the overall aim, which is shared by many philosophers these days, many philosophers and others who, who try to pay attention to philosophy of science, uh, particularly those who come to things like the SPSP conferences that Sarah mentioned, there is an overall aim shared by many of these people, which is to make a philosophy of science that is fit for studying and guiding actual scientific practices, actual scientific knowledge, actual scientific progress, with the emphasis on actual. And the idea that philosophy should be providing tools of thinking that we can actually use. And this is the kind of idea that what we can think of as traditional or standard philosophy of science is really unfit to perform. For two main reasons I'll mention right now, the first of which is that the classic accounts of scientific knowledge given in philosophy of science has tended to leave out a lot of really important aspects of scientific knowledge a lot of things to do with how science learns to observe things, how science develops experimental methods, a lot of things to do with the material engagement that scientists make with nature, everything ranging from how to do bioassays to synthesize complex chemical substances. All that gets left out, and, and this, I think, is why there was such a resonance among many people uh, when, for example, Ian Hacking published his Representing and Intervening, that whole intervening half of the book. Wow, we were not talking about this. That's why I think works of mine, like the book called Inventing Temperature, had resonance because I was digging into how do we learn to actually do things like make measurement. So generally speaking, traditional philosophy of science has left out a lot of what I think of as the action dimension of scientific work. Another major reason for this unfitness of standard philosophy of science is that it puts up a lot of unrealistic ideals. And this is an echo of what Paul Teller calls the perfect model model of science. Um, so what people have called the realistic spirit, which has uh, many articulators over the ages, is um, a really an important part of my orientation in this book. 
But you might ask, why make radical moves? Why go to very notions of reality and truth and knowledge itself? Um, this is because when I try to fix that unfitness of the standard philosophy of science, I felt that um, a lot of practice-oriented projects were held back very often by the residual traditional notions about what knowledge is, uh, about what truth is, and how science should seek it, and, and so on. So I thought we have to go back to the most basic concepts. I, I don't want to say fundamental because it doesn't have the right connotations, but basic stuff we need, like water for life, stuff we need, like walls and roof for houses, you know, and notions like truth and reality, knowledge. I mean, how else would we think about science? So, um, in that sense, I think the ambition of my project is comparable to what someone like Joe Rouse, uh, great to have you here, Joe, um, has been doing for many, many decades now. No, not many, many decades. <laughs> <laughs> many, many. <laughs> right. Two and two. <laughs> my track record on in this direction is thin because this is not, this kind of abstract philosophy is not what I do normally. Usually I'm getting mixed up in the details, but on this occasion I felt that I had to. So um, there are many other people that I won't go into that I have been inspired by in a similar way. And the reason I p p pick up pragmatism is because that's the existing philosophical tradition that I see has most to offer as uh, by way of inspiration and conceptual resources for what I'm trying to do. Uh, and I won't go much into pragmatism today, but I'm just marking that my favorite pragmatists are Dewey and C.I. Lewis. Now, If you've, uh, so, so I think you've all been given the introduction in chapter one. So in chapter one of the book, uh, you see me laying down some basic ideas of what I call active knowledge. So um, that this radical step that, that I mentioned starts with saying that practices or doings should be placed at the heart of our picture of knowledge not just taken in as something peripheral to what knowledge really is, which traditionally is conceived as a bunch of propositions that are hopefully true. And um, the reason I think we should do this is because if we start by, you know, what you get in Epistemology 101, starting with the notion, well, knowledge is something like justified through belief. Oh, no, but it's not exactly that. So let's see how we have to refine that notion to get to what knowledge really is like. And I don't think we're going to get to where we need to get to if we start from that point. And in the manuscript, you might have noticed uh, uh, me referring to a, an old Irish joke very briefly, in case you haven't noticed, um, it goes like this. So there's a traveler who is lost in the west of Ireland, uh, looking for this little picturesque village called Letter Frank. Uh, so the traveler asks a farmer whom, whom he meets on the road, says, how do I get to Letter Frank? And the farmer, in typical Irish fashion, gives a very friendly, very long discourse on what all you'd have to do to get to letter frack from wherever they were. This is out on the west coast, County Galway. Anyway, um, having recounted that whole story of how you would get to letter frack, the farmer said, oh, but if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> so that's how I feel about the standard propositional conception of knowledge. 
Yeah, we could get to a kind of epistemology that's suitable for understanding scientific practice by starting with justified true belief and doing some magical acrobatics to make that notion suitable. But I don't think that's a good way to start. I think we should instead start with what I call active knowledge, which is a notion of knowledge as an ability to do something. And make that our primary notion of knowledge around which we fit what it means to have propositional knowledge. So here I, I take inspiration from Percy Bridgman, right, who was really very misunderstood about what people called operationalism. Um, I think this little statement from Bridgman in looking back on a lot of his work later in life really sums up the spirit of it, where he says, it is better because it takes us further to analyze into doings or happenings rather than into objects or entities. Again, um, this is going to tell me to look at this basic distinction I've made between propositional knowledge and active knowledge. And here uh, another good source of inspiration is Gilbert Ryle, not only in how he distinguished what he called knowing how and knowing that, but I'm thinking of Ryle's argument that the so-called knowing that, the propositional kind of knowledge, is actually only functional within the context of what he called knowing how, what I'm calling, roughly speaking, what I'm calling active knowledge. And Ryan points out things like, you know, how do we even learn language in which to express these propositions? You can only learn language if you have some non-verbal skills to begin with. Like when you're trying to teach children language by pointing to things and telling them, yes, that's an apple, that's a gold atom. <laughs> So Ryle's view is that we can only speak if we know how to do things, first of all. And that is how it has to be, right? Not only in the growing up of children, but evolutionarily as well, right? We do descend from non-verbal animals. And how would language develop at all if certain animals who are developing language didn't already know how to do lots of things so that the whole activity of speaking can be supported. So that in a very small and intuitive nutshell is the idea of active knowledge and I think that's the framing into which we must put our thinking about the nature and product of scientific practice. And then comes a question, all right, so, so let's suppose you buy my whole thing about active knowledge. We're philosophers. We want to think about not only what knowledge is, but what good knowledge is. Right? How do we judge the quality of this thing called active knowledge? Now, if you're thinking about propositional knowledge, the answer to the equivalent question is quite straightforward. You have a proposition, you want it to be true. True proposition, true belief is a good thing to have and that's what you try to do, what you try to attain. But what about active knowledge? What is good active knowledge? And this is the context in which um, this notion that I call operational coherence comes up. Operational coherence is going to be the main criterion by which we judge the quality of what we do and it's going to be the notion that serves as this hinge around which everything else basically in the book turns. And it's not a notion that I just conjured up out of thin air, it's a concept that I needed long before I was writing this book. So um, this is the origin if you want. So when I was writing my previous book, the one called Is Water H2O, published uh, exactly 10 years ago, 
Um, I had put up these notions of epistemic activity and system of practice in order to talk about, right, these are terms I invented so that I could have concepts with which to talk about the scientific practices that I was looking at. And in trying to articulate what these things are, without thinking about it very carefully, I stuck in this word coherent. So I said an epistemic activity is a coherent set of mental or physical operations intended to contribute to the production or improvement of knowledge, blah, blah. Because I thought, right, I, if there's a, just a bunch of doings that don't cohere with each other, that's not an activity. They have to go together towards the satisfaction of some identifiable aim. So in that definition and the similar one for system of practice, coherent was not a technical term. It's just something that, that I said in order to express this intuitive sense uh, of, of what is needed. And this is the notion that then developed into what I call operational coherence to distinguish it from the logical kind of coherence that other philosophers have talked about. And I'm not going to go through this sort of intermediate definition which I uh, put up five years ago and then regretted. Um, I was trying to please the philosophers by doing an if and only if thing, and it didn't work. So uh, now there's a whole section in chapter one on operational coherence. It's become more nebulous than that attempted precise definition, but I think that is a sign of progress. So what is operational coherence? Let me just, just you know, briefly uh, go through that because it is the central notion, really. I sum it up in this phrase, aim-oriented coordination. So there are lots of examples I try to give. Um, this is because Philip Kitcher, uh, bless him, once told me I was really not very good at um, this abstract kind of philosophy, the cut and thrust of analytic philosophy. He said I should really always use examples and illustrate the point by you know, the concrete things that I'm quite good at thinking about. So I am trying to follow his advice. Lots of examples are given in the book of what makes operational coherence. There's a whole range, right, from just a simple coordination of bodily movements involved in you know, everything from walking up the stairs to drinking a cup of coffee. And then at the other extreme, my favorite example is the GPS system, global positioning system. Right? which every time I think about it, it's just incredible. How, how can this thing work? But it does, and what they have to do, right, if you don't know, is coordinate a whole set of geosynchronous satellites, which they um, fly using good old-fashioned Newtonian mechanics, and then they put atomic clocks on these satellites, right, which track the exact differences of time that different signals from different satellites take to go to a place on Earth and come back. And then these atomic clock readings have to be corrected using both general and special relativity, not together, separately, right? Because there's time dilation due to speed and there's uh, the change of clock rates depending on the place in the gravitational field. And then the signal gets beamed down to you and me, and we just walk around with our phones <laughs> pretending that the Earth is flat. <laughs> All of these material, conceptual things have to be brought together in an incredibly harmonious way. I've said incredibly already four times in this talk, I will stop. In order to make this whole activity of um, satellite navigation work. So roughly speaking, what we're talking about is a harmonious fitting together of elements and aspects of an activity um, that is conducive to the 
successful achievement of the aims of the activity in question. And a coherent activity is one that is well designed, I would think. Right? And underlying that design has to be some kind of understanding. This is where Oscar Westerblatt comes in to tell me what understanding means, because I don't know what it means. So that's the notion of operational coherence for now. Uh, it, it is work in progress, it will change and evolve, I hope. And then once you have that notion, there's a lot you can do and a lot you need it for. So in chapter four of the book, um, I advance this reconfigured pragmatist notion of truth, well, which I call truth by operational coherence. The reason that there's a mouthful of a phrase is to, to indicate for sure that this is not the only notion of truth, I think, that is there uh, or that is valid. But in the empirical domains, um, what I think of as primary truth, I think has to be this way. By primary truth, I mean truth that we know from direct engagement with reality rather than truth we know by comparison to some other truth that we already know is true. So I say a statement is true to the extent that there are operationally coherent activities that can be performed by relying on its content. I think this is really what people like William James meant when he gave the pragmatic notion of truth. And likewise, even reality, what does it mean for something to be real? I say an entity is real to the extent that there are operationally coherent activities that can be performed by relying significantly on its existence and its properties. And there's a dual meaning of that annoying word reality. Um, so the main definition I give is being real, realness and then a reality would also be a thing that is real and that's a harmless kind of ambiguity. Now there, there's obviously a lot to unpack in these two definitions of reality and truth, so that's chapters three and four, um, if you're interested. Uh, but I think for now the point is that reconceiving the very notions of reality and truth in terms of operational coherence like this renders them as concepts that are operative in actual pra practice. I think we actually do have this kind of notion of reality when we go around saying things like ghosts aren't real, or yes they are. <laughs> and when we say similar things in daily life about truth. Now, I'm coming to the really last part. So, if there are any run-of-the-mill scientific realists in this room, I don't know if there are, but if you were one, you're probably thinking, but, 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 right, this is crazy. Well, you may be kinder than to say this is crazy, but you may at least be thinking, we don't really need to go into these strange notions because we have got something perfectly good that uh, we already believe. So this is the kind of um, response I got, for example, by, from Anjan Chakravarti, who is not really a standard scientific realist, but he understands them very well and he can speak in their voice. So um, when I spoke, uh, when I gave a very early version of my uh, material about reality, um, Anjan was in the audience and said, yeah, yeah I, I, I can see what you mean, but I don't need your stuff because I already have something that works. And what is it? What is that article of faith as I think of it? It's this picture, right? There is mind independent reality which has a definite shape, and our theories are true if they correctly express the shape of such reality. And we, we may never know the truth for sure, but 
it does exist and it's the most important goal for science to strive towards. That's sort of the common sense of um, scientific realism. I call it correspondence realism um, with these two main parts. One is what people have called metaphysical realism, the notion that there is mind-independent reality out there, and the other is the correspondence theory of truth. And to get what I call in the book standard scientific realism, you add a few other premises which are about the aims of science and the ability of science to reach correspondence. <coughs> but even if you're completely skeptical about the abilities of science, um, you may be a correspondence realist who subscribe to these two tenets, and you might say, oh yeah, and I think science is completely powerless to reach any knowledge of truth like this. Then you would be an anti-realist, but still be a correspondence realist. And the main problem, right, which I think we, we have to learn to see about correspondence realism is the futility of it. And I think Putnam gave a very nice expression of that when he said in his little book on pragmatism, to say that truth is correspondence to reality is not false but empty, as long as nothing is said about what the correspondence is. If correspondence is supposed to be utterly independent of the ways in which we confirm the assertions we make, then the correspondence is an occult one, and our supposed grasp of it is also occult. And some people at this point say, oh, well, we can have at least a minimalist notion of correspondence truth, and, and they will give you the Tarski, uh, this quotation schema, right? The proverbial snow is white is true, if and only if snow is white. So, okay, suppose somebody is worrying about the truth of quantum mechanics, and you tell them, ah, oh, but be assured. <laughs> The Schrodinger equation, I don't have the heart to read that out, uh, is true if and only if the Schrodinger equation. And that's not really going to help us. Now, I am making this, of course, very crude, but um, the deep and profound things that people do say about the Tarski T schema, they are deep and profound, but they don't help practice oriented philosophy of science. No. Sorry, then that, I, I will explain why that's there. So I think um, the emptiness of correspondence truth should serve as a, a little reminder that going down that road is going to be like that road to letter frank. Uh, it's not going to be a very enlightening journey. But, I mean, I, I think you all have this experience if you talk to philosophers at all. People really are attached to the idea of correspondence truth. They really have this really strong correspondence intuition. So I'm going to try to spend the remaining time to see if we can, see if I can help you get out of that intuition. Because I think you probably all have it as well. I have it. I have to occasionally just <laughs> push it down, right? It's like the business that Wittgenstein um, gave us a memorable picture of, right? To, to lead the fly out of the fly bottle, because the fly keeps flying into the glass wall of the bottle and not able to see how he should go that way out. So. Um, the most memorable illustration I experienced of this intuitive pull of correspondence realism comes from my friend uh, Alistair Isaac, a philosopher at the University of Edinburgh. And when we had a discussion about my material uh, in, in Edinburgh a few years ago, he said, but, but, they really are cockroaches. <laughs> As part of mind independent reality, doesn't matter whether you think they are cockroaches, doesn't matter whether you have a concept at all of cockroaches, 
they are there and they're exactly as they are. <laughs> so there's Alistair looking like a man who's seen a lot of cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we get away from this kind of intuition? So uh, what Alistair is voicing there is uh, what I call the fallacy of prefiguration in the book. Dewey has lots of different names for this kind of thing, as Celine can, can tell you all about. Uh, the crude version of this is a bit like the cockroaches. The crude version of this fantasy goes, right, uh, we, we have this picture of the universe that modern science, or whoever you listen to, tells us, and that really is the right picture. And then a fortiori, there is a picture that the reality has, and, oh yeah, and it is that picture. Now, more subtly, uh, people, of course, are fallibilists if they're thinking about things, and they will say, well, you see, the, the picture we have of reality is maybe wrong, but there must be some correct picture about how mind-independent reality is. And we hope to find it. And even if we don't find it, we keep searching. That that's the Karl Popper version of realism. Right? Now, I think the core of this fallacy is to think that an object specified by a concept really exists independently somewhere out there from our conceptualization of it. And I think um, the best person that I've read who really tries to expose the absurdity of that view is the Chilean philosopher Roberto Toretti, who says, the scientific realist, so-called, believe that reality is well defined once and for all, independently of human action and human thought, yet in a way that can be adequately articulated in human discourse. He continues to point out that the realist hold that science aims to develop just the sort of discourse which adequately articulates reality, which, as Plato said, cuts nature uh, at, at its joints. And that modern science is visibly approaching the fulfillment of this aim. And Toretti says, when I really think about it, I don't even understand what these pronouncements mean, not to mention agree with them. So, I think Tourette is right, but the problem is uh, articulating this fallacy doesn't seem to have the effect of making the intuition go away. So, Alistair Isaac's still going to come back and say, but the cockroaches. <laughs> so, I think this is a bit like the situation with visual illusions, right? You all know this one, for example, the Muller line illusion, in which, right, this top line looks shorter than the one in the middle, even though they're really exactly the same. But even being shown that they are exactly the same doesn't make the effect go away. So, how do we deal with this? I think there are things we can do. The first thing to do is to take away the fear. When people say, but, but, but there, there must be a mind-independent reality that is fixed the way it is, they're doing that because they're afraid of bad constructivism. They think if we don't defend that notion, that we'll, then we'll end up with a philosophy which declares that we can change the way reality is just by thinking differently about it. So in order to, to stop that thought process in its tracks, I'm proposing in the book a disambiguation of the notion of mind independence into, uh, well, mind dependence, rather, into what I call mind control and mind framing. And the new common sense that I propose in that language uh, is that all entities are mind-framed, but real entities are not mind-controlled, at least not entirely. Meaning, reality doesn't do as we wish. Right? That, that's the so-called resistance. 
But anything and everything that we can even think or talk about is already framed in our concept. So, so I, I thought I should make a reference there, not only to Kant, but in this town to Niels Bohr, uh, because I think that's how he really thought about complementarity, for example. So another worry that people have about um, my kind of notion of reality is that you will end up with an uncontrolled pluralism ontological kind of pluralism and I think that's actually all right so think about the, the famous fable from Arthur Eddington about the two tables right I think most people know about that where Eddington says ah oh, isn't it curious in front of us we have this solid table of everyday life but when you think about scientifically there's no such thing as Solid table is a swarm of atoms and mostly empty space. And I think we need to learn to think how they are both real in their own domains. So I can say more about that if people are interested. And I think correspondence to reality of the kind that is what I'm calling correspondence realists to talk about really is a metaphor. It's a metaphor of um, actual activities of representation that we make in real life. In which case, right, if I'm looking at someone painting a portrait, then I, both you and the painting are accessible to me. It's not the situation in which the reality is totally inaccessible. The theories I make about the reality are accessible and somehow magically they're supposed to correspond to each other. So I think we need to lose the thought, first of all, that the universe is a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. And Plato ha has a lot to answer for here. We also have his cave metaphor. This kind of thing I think we do need to engage with. So. I mean, it's a very persuasive metaphor, uh, right? That I know there are uh, many disputes about exactly how to read it, but take that, you know, cartoon image of people who want to escape the cave and see the real reality out there. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I think if we got out of our cave, we'll only emerge into another cave. And it may be caves all the way out. We're never going to emerge into this view of real reality that is mind unframed and giving us the God's eye view. So I think these metaphors need to be modified, resisted, sometimes <coughs> discarded, and sometimes I think we need to create more metaphors. And I'm just going to give you one. Um, Revealing for the first time the cover of my book. <laughs> now, that Oscar will recognize that picture, maybe some others of you. It's from Trondheim in Norway. Um, now, you might wonder why is the picture upside down. So let me explain, but I'm going to use a Danish example. Because this picture is how um, the whole idea actually began. So this was several years back when I was visiting Orvus. Um, wonderful snowy day. Uh, well, a few days before this, um, there was a massive snowstorm. Uh, just as we were trying to fly into Orvus, <laughs> Ryanair in his true form, just dumped us in Billen because <laughs> they couldn't fly to Oris and said bye. <laughs> so the heroic ground staff at Billen Airport um, eventually found the bus for us to uh, ride to Oris. And anyway, this is a few days later, a wonderfully snowy day. I, I took a, my wife uh, took a picture of this um, old house at this place called Den Gamlebu, 
uh, the old town, I think that means, where you can see uh, old Danish architecture and, and crafts. And anyway, wonderful place. Go visit if you're ever in Norris. But I thought that's a nice picture. And then it occurred to me, right, so this is like uh, the normal view philosophers have of representation. Right? So here's reality up there completely sharp in its uh, shape and then oh the reflection is like our representation sadly imperfect we try to approximate the shape of reality but we fail then I thought no it's not like that it's more like this I thought in, in our representations we clean stuff up this is Nancy Cartwright speaking through my head <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she was my teacher, so I'm not just claiming this. I, uh, so, when we make our representations, we impose the forms that we find pleasing, we find simple, we find understandable. And the question is not whether this nice, sharp picture corresponds exactly to this blurry thing above? No, there are many other questions, but the question is not that. Right. Now, metaphors all have problems. This one has one main one, which I will explain, and, and I'm going to suggest how we should learn to read this picture. So the problem with this inverted picture metaphor is that you would look at, it, look at it and think that I, I'm claiming that reality is blurry. No, I'm not claiming that real, real, ultimate reality, mind unframed, is blurry. No, the blurry stuff is reality as given in the initial conceptualization of framing that we have at the start of inquiry. Now, Celine can tell me whether I read Dewey correctly or not. I think this fits exactly with Dewey's notion of inquiry as starting with a disturbed situation. And then we try it and try to make, it, make the situation orderly and sensible through our activity of inquiry. So I think that's what happens. It's not that ultimate reality is blurry, but it's what we start with and is already mind-framed. Both sides of this picture belong in the Kantian phenomenal realm. It's not that one side, either side, is in the noumenon. The noumenon doesn't have a shape. Right? So I think um, that is the way to read that picture, and the picture is the picture of an iterative process another old idea of mine. Right? We never start with the tabula rasa, we start with some conceptualization and then we try to improve it in, in our representation of what we got. So I think this is a picture of real representation, representation that happens in real life, in actual practices. We take the given that is given through our initial conceptions and at the end we emerge with a newly conceptualized version of reality. Now, uh, time is passing on so I'm just going to do the final section briefly and then um, hopefully we have... Sorry? Yeah. Do you want me to talk for a long time? <laughs> Oh, you're objecting to <laughs> <laughs> This is going to come up in uh, Brad Ray's talk as well. So I, I have to say something about why I'm calling this realism. Because many people say, no, no, what you're talking about isn't really realism. <laughs> it's because words do matter. And we shouldn't let people take words that we care about and 
distort them into meaning other things. So <laughs> I don't want to get too much into American politics, but <laughs> that is that is on my mind, that as probably on yours as well. So when people talk about the ideal of freedom, they don't mean probably what you and I mean by freedom. The really recent shock of, of abortion rights case in the US, the anti-abortion people scored a great rhetorical victory decades ago when they labeled their position pro-life, as if the other people didn't care about life. And it was a great mistake on, on the other side to let that happen. So I don't want to let that happen with realism. If we say we're not realists, we cannot comfortably endorse the search for truth and reality. And we do need to talk about truth and reality. And you know, during the so-called postmodern era, in the last decades of the last century, a lot of academics were feeling smug about truth and reality, saying, ah, these are just outdated notions, we don't need them anymore. Then came Trump and the New York Times, which a lot of those people read, got very worried and they started stressing that, no, 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 we are trying to give you the truth and half price. <laughs> truth, truth became really important for daily life again and I think that is right and the same for reality. We do want to be able to say things like, the president has lost touch with reality. But what do we mean by that? I think we mean precisely the kind of thing that I'm trying to articulate through the notion of operational coherence. So I think this is the real question. How did standard scientific realism come to be called realism at all? The question is not, not why do I want to call my crap realism? <laughs> no, how, how did this extremely bad kind of realism from the conceptual engineering perspective, get to be called realism, right? It, because it puts up this unrealistic ideal of knowledge, it doesn't deal with real practices, and it doesn't even focus on actual realities. So how, in, in what sense can this thing be justly called realism? And calling that thing realism creates a really harmful ambiguity, right? Because this completely unrealistic doctrine parades as under the name of realism. And that's why I think the title I given to my book immediately works, right? When I tell people the title, they get it, they get it immediately and they laugh. And then I'm done. <laughs> I should really never have written this book. I should have just put up the title and let people imagine what it says. So I think realism ought to mean the pursuit of truth and reality, but it really ought to mean a pursuit that can actually be made and assessed as we go along. So in that spirit is this notion of realism, which I've labeled activist realism in the last chapter, uh, which means a commitment to do whatever we can actually do in order to improve knowledge. And this is realism in a realistic spirit and creates this kind of abundant shape of knowledge that Feyerabend um, advocated, as Rory Kent will back me up about. And Feyerabend, not only him, but even Popper and Rakatos can be very unlikely allies in this um, thing I'm calling activist realism because they all insisted that we should really do our utmost to learn stuff. And that, I think, is the spirit of empiricism in a true sense of the term. So it's an activism of an epistemic kind on the ground, not the kind of utopianism or wishful thinking that I think standard scientific realism often ends up uh, advocating. So, I, I, I've spoken too long already, so I'm going to stop. 
Um, I do look forward to all the talks, all the commentaries, uh, all the comments that all of you might have, starting with um, the remaining parts of this session. So thank you so much.